Welcome to section one of endocrine embryology. There are a lot of endocrine organs, but the two that we will focus on in this lecture are the thyroid gland and the pituitary gland. The rest of embryology is covered in other videos. So let's start with the thyroid gland, and let's get an overall idea of where we're going with the development of the thyroid gland. So here's what it should look like in the end. It has two lobes, and in the middle there's this isthmus, and the thyroid gland is responsible for releasing thyroid hormone, or T3 and T4. And as you can see, the thyroid sits just anterior to the trachea. But the cells that end up becoming the thyroid gland, as you see here, actually originate somewhere else. So let's talk about how it develops and travels. Let's make sure you have an appropriate framework for where we're going. This is the embryo overview image, and you can see the developing fetus right here. If we took a cross section early in development, like through here, you'd be able to see the pharyngeal apparatus. This image shows the pharyngeal apparatus, which gives rise to different structures of the neck. And this process is discussed in detail in the reproductive embryology chapter. Right now, just focus on two things, the pharyngeal floor and the fourth pharyngeal pouch. And the pouch is identified as this pink stuff. Now going back to the pharyngeal floor, this is where the thyroid diverticulum will actually originate. And the endoderm of the fourth pouch will give rise to the parafollicular or C cells of the thyroid. And going back to the thyroid diverticulum, it will travel down and give rise to the follicular cells of the thyroid. Now, taking a step back, you can see that the thyroid gland was made of endoderm from the pharyngeal apparatus, some from the pharyngeal floor, which was endoderm, and some from the fourth pharyngeal pouch, which is also endoderm. So we talked about this migration here of the thyroid diverticulum. Let's clarify that process. Let's start with the image on the left. To orient you, we have the tip of the tongue right here, and this would be anterior, and then back here would be posterior, and this right here is the pharyngeal apparatus. And this circle right here is the thyroid diverticulum. And as you can see, it travels down and ultimately forms the thyroid. And the fourth pouch, which is right here, is where the parafollicular cells come from. And the image on the right shows an anterior perspective focused on the lower neck. And we can't see the tongue or the pharyngeal apparatus from this angle. But what you need to know is that the thyroid diverticulum came from the tongue and traveled down to form the thyroid and it left behind this thyroglossal duct. Eventually, the thyroglossal duct disappears, or at least it should. If it persists, it can lead to other issues, and it can also lead to another lobe, like the pyramidal lobe. As a brief review, the thyroid diverticulum will travel from the pharyngeal apparatus down to form the thyroid gland. And what you really need to know at the end of this is that the thyroid tissue is made of follicular and parafollicular cells which are both derived from endoderm. Lastly, the thyroglossal duct is the pathway between the thyroid and the tongue, and normally it degenerates. And although the thyroglossal duct will degenerate, some structures will persist. One of the normal remnants of the thyroglossal duct is the foramen cecum. In fact, this is expected in everyone. It's also normal to have a pyramidal lobe. Not everyone has a pyramidal lobe, but if one is present, it's considered a normal variant. And this image shows the remnants of the thyroglossal duct, for example, the foramen cecum and the pyramidal lobe. However, it's abnormal if the thyroglossal duct itself persists. This can lead to something called thyroglossal duct cysts. Let's dive into that more now. And as I just mentioned, a thyroglossal duct cyst occurs when there's failure of the thyroglossal duct degenerating. These occur in the midline. As we saw, the thyroglossal duct runs down the midline from the tongue and the pharyngeal apparatus down to the anterior neck. So it makes sense that the cyst would appear in the midline. Also, it moves upon swallowing and tongue protrusion. So it's a movable mass. And it's usually asymptomatic unless it's infected. And these cysts are usually seen and noticed by five years of age and they may or may not have thyroid tissue that's functional. The image on the left again shows normal thyroid development, and this thyroglossal duct normally degenerates. And on the right, we see what happens when it doesn't degenerate and thyroglossal cysts develop. This is a lateral perspective showing the cysts in the midline, and they can occur anywhere from the foramen cecum up at the top down to the thyroid itself. So you can see these cysts depicted here. Here's a picture of a thyroglossal duct cyst. Notice that it's midline, and it will be movable when this patient swallows. Now let's talk about ectopic thyroid. This occurs when thyroid tissue is found in abnormal places. The most common site is the tongue, where it will usually appear as a palpable mass. And if it's the only functional thyroid tissue in the body, 
then removing it will cause hypothyroidism. Now that we've discussed thyroid embryology, let's discuss pituitary gland embryology. And just so you're not lost, let's go back to this embryo overview image. Right now, I want you to focus just on this idea, specifically that notochord, which is there in the center. This notochord leads to a process called neurulation, which leads to the formation of the neural tube. This image shows the process of neurulation in more detail. You can see the notochord right here, and this entire plane is the ectoderm. And you can see the neural plate in the middle. This inner blue portion will fold in, and now you can see the neural folds in yellow, and the neural groove in blue. This leads to the neural tube over here on the right, as well as the neural crest cells. The neural tube is covered in more detail in neuroembryology. For this lecture, all you need to know is that these neural crest cells and the neural tube are considered neuroectoderm. And what remains is the surface ectoderm, which you can consider the epidermis. And it's this neuroectoderm that gives rise to the posterior pituitary gland. So the posterior pituitary gland forms from the neuroectoderm of the diencephalon. And since the posterior pituitary is simply an extension of the diencephalon, which goes on to form several structures in the brain, including the hypothalamus, the posterior pituitary gland is forever connected to the hypothalamus. This slide is from Endocrine Physiology, Section 2. I just want to point out that ADH and oxytocin are made in the hypothalamus, but they're released from the posterior pituitary. This relationship is possible because the posterior pituitary gland was simply an extension of the brain and hypothalamus. And with that, let's move on to the anterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary gland forms from the surface ectoderm of the roof of the mouth, and it forms what's called Rathke's pouch. An important fact to remember is that craniopharyngiomas are cancers that are a remnant of Rathke's pouch. This image demonstrates the formation of the pituitary gland. You can see the neural tube right here. It's this entire structure. And the orange segment is considered the diencephalon. And if you're looking at this diencephalon, you can see this bulge right here. And this is neuroectoderm becoming the posterior pituitary. And recall that the neural tube is considered neuroectoderm. So this bulge from the diencephalon here is neuroectoderm, which will become the posterior pituitary gland. Now we can see the early gut tube right here. It's this structure. And right here is the roof of the mouth, which bulges out, becoming Rathke's pouch. And that will form the anterior pituitary gland. If you look at the box on the bottom of the image, you can see how the posterior and anterior pituitary glands come together. The neuroectoderm right here comes downward, and Rathke's pouch comes up. And now we can see an early version of the entire pituitary gland. Now let's look to the rightmost image. Eventually, Rathke's pouch will break off from the roof of the mouth, and then the pituitary gland will rest in the cella tersica of the skull. And you can see that the pituitary gland now has a posterior lobe and an anterior lobe. To wrap up, let's do a quick question to apply what you've learned. A gland derived from the endoderm is dysfunctional. Which hormone was most likely released by this gland? ADH or triiodothyronine. Now, ADH is released from the posterior pituitary gland, which was derived from neuroectoderm, which was derived from ectoderm. Triiodothyronine, or T3, is released from the thyroid gland. And you may recall that the cells that make up the thyroid come from endoderm in the pharyngeal apparatus. So going back to our question, we're thinking of a gland that's derived from endoderm. And which of these two hormones was most likely released by this gland? Triiodothyronine. And that concludes this section.